everyone. Super excited for you guys to be joining us on YouTube for another YouTube exclusive. This is gonna be from a presentation that I did for my good friend, and you may have heard her on the podcast before, Bijal Patel. If you don't know Bijal, she is the go-to branding expert. She did all the branding for Move Martial Arts. She's worked with some amazing companies on helping them create a brand, refresh brands, rebrand. She knows everything about how to make your brand stand out in a crowded marketplace. And I was so honored when she invited me to come and speak at her event where we talked about how to become the leader that you are meant to be. And in this, I share some of the things that we do within our own companies to really help best lead our team. And I'll be the first to say, I am not a perfect leader in any way. I'm just simply sharing what has worked for us and what's worked for our companies with you. So I hope you get a lot out of it. This will probably be a good presentation to take some notes on as well. And I would love to hear all about your implementation. So just drop them in the comments below. Let me know what you got out of this. So that way we can continue to push our content in a direction that best serves you. I am honored to be here talking to all of you. Um, I know a lot of us are running our own companies, yes? yes? Okay, how many of you guys have teams that you manage? Cool. So for all of us, leadership is gonna be essential. Uh, and the cool thing is I've done great at leadership and I've also failed at leadership a bunch of times as well. And uh, I have learned more from the times I failed at leadership on how to become a better leader. And I'm hoping that I can share some of that with you guys today so you guys don't have to have some of the same failures that I've had and you can just learn from my experience without having to go through it yourself. Sound good? Sweet. Okay, one of my favorite quotes on leadership, Ralph Waldo Emerson, every great institution is the, the length and shadow of a single man or woman, right? Your company is a direct reflection of who you are. Okay, a company with character often has a leader with character. A company that's growing consistently and scaling fast usually has a leader that is focused on personal growth and scaling and evolving themselves. In the same vein, most businesses don't have business problems. They have personal problems that get in the way of the business. Yes. Yes. Most of our business problems are really problems that we're dealing with in our personal life that we allow to creep into the business. So the more that we can work on ourselves and develop ourselves as better leaders, the less likely we are gonna have personal problems that creep into the business. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Yes. So what I wanna go over with everyone today is just seven learnings that I've had over the past few years on uh, either opportunities or circumstances that have helped me to become a better leader. And the first one we're gonna start with is what I call unshakable authenticity, which this is actually one of the core values that Beagle's team came up with us. Yes, go for it, Bijal. Uh, so unshakable authenticity. Um, for me, being a leader isn't a, a performance. It's not a role. It's me showing up and being able to embrace who I am on a daily basis and bring that authenticity to my team. Okay, when we have new team members come on and we start asking them about their last job, most of the time they didn't quit the job, they quit the boss. They had a boss that they didn't align with. They had a boss that would say things but not actually show the same things with their actions, which I think all of us have probably had a boss like that throughout our lives. We don't wanna be that person to our team. So for us, it's about embracing who we are. Also, when you have unshakable authenticity, your self-worth becomes attached to who you are instead of the things in your life, the revenue of your business and it makes life way easier to live. It makes you much happier and more fulfilled in the process. So if you're watching a normal presentation, it usually starts with something like this, right? Where they go through all of the things about what they've done. So they'll say stuff like, I'm a dad and husband first, multiple seven figure companies, martial arts school owner, Beagle's favorite client, more, more cool shit that makes me look good, even more cool shit, and then just when you thought there wasn't any more, more cool shit, right? So this though to me is an unshakable authenticity. This is a list of words to try and sway your perspective of me. So what we do is whenever we have a new employee that joins our team, they get an SOP on how to work with Adam. And this is what brings the authenticity to them. So if you guys wanna take your phones out and just scan this for a second, 
We'll go through this together just to show you some of the things that we outline in this. And to be totally transparent, this is not even my idea. See that authenticity right there? Yeah. Uh, this Dan Martell, I had a conversation with him when he was on our podcast. And uh, he's like, I have an SOP for how people should work with me. And I was like, well, maybe I should do that. And I talked to my team and I'm like, hey guys, what are my expectations? And they're like, we don't know. And I'm like, all right, time to create an SOP. So if you guys pull this up on your phone, uh, I started this as a weekly memo for our team. So every week I send out a memo to our team just on random things that I'm going through, thinking about all of that stuff, again, to help with the authenticity. This was the first one though. So you'll see on here, the very first thing that we go over is what I expect of myself. It's not telling them what to do to impress me. It's what I expect of me. So that way they know the standards that I'm holding myself to. And all these are really are my personal core values. So if you have personal core values, that's where you start. If you don't have personal core values, I would bet that decision making is hard for you because you don't have rules to make decisions by without a set of personal core values. Okay, so it's like, when we come up with this, it's who do I wanna be, how do I wanna live, what is important to me, what is valuable to me. Then, after we cover this, in this how to work with Adam SOP, we go over what I expect of my staff. I want day one of their new hire onboarding to know exactly what's expected of them in all of our companies. Okay, and also it helps your team to make sure they hold each other accountable because everyone understands what my expectations for them are. Okay, they know I have high standards. They know that done isn't 5 p.m., but it's when I finish the project, okay? We go through all of these things. So one of the things that I looked at when I first started putting this list together was where are the holes in our companies right now where the standards and expectations aren't being met? Because most likely it's because I'm not doing a good job communicating those standards or expectations to my team. So I sat down with my CEO and we went through this list of, hey, what, what do we wanna communicate better as far as expectations go? And this was a big culture changing thing for all of our companies. And after we sent this out, I had a, a lot of team members reach out to me and they're like, I, I feel like I get it and I understand you more as a result of this. The next part we go over is the principles of how I run my companies. So I want my team to understand the motivation and the why and the purpose behind what we do because otherwise your team just thinks it's money driven, okay? Especially if you are like a heavy goal setting company with your team and you're pushing them to hit metrics, if they don't know your purpose and your why, it, they just think you're about money, which means every, everything that you ask them to do is gonna be transactional. It's not what we want, okay? We want relationships. We want them to show, show them that we're human and we also wanna show them that we see that they're human as well and we're just humans corresponding with each other. From there, this was a fun one. Tips to work with Adam from those who have worked with Adam. <laughs> so I reached out to ex-employees and I also reached out to people that are currently employed with me that have worked with me the longest. And I sent them a text and I was like, hey, can you give me five tips for working with me that you would tell someone that was a new hire for one of our companies? And I even reached out to people that I fired to ask the same thing. That was fun. You guys wanna exercise in self-awareness? Do that. Um, but now they have this, and the, the very last thing is Adam's shortcomings. I want them to know what I suck at. I want them to know what I need to work on. If we think about all of our team members when we hire them, if you're the CEO, you're automatically on a pedestal with that person, which means there's a disconnect in communication immediately because they see you up here so they feel like they can't bring certain things to you. They can't give you feedback on certain things because they maybe don't feel important enough or they feel like you're just at a level where you probably don't care what they have to think or say. When you, we can show our team that we're vulnerable and we can be honest with them about our weaknesses, it bridges that gap. So they see you more as a human instead of the CEO that's up here, which means conversations are more honest, feedback is more honest. They're not worried about you being defensive when they bring something to you. So if you guys get one thing from this presentation, create a SOP for how to work with you and give that to every single person that works for your company. I give this to like vendors that work with us and people that partner with us as well. 
And I've just said, hey, here's this thing. And like every time I give it to someone, they're like, this is genius, can I steal this? Yeah, and, it, and this document, guys, started in my notes section of my phone and took maybe like an hour to put together. So it's nothing crazy. Um, but just think to yourselves, like how can we do a better job communicating expectations? And this is a, a good way to do that. Okay, part two, what I call hold the line. We all have standards in our company, yes? yes sir. What typically happens with the downfalls of company is this. They start with their standards up here and then they have employees not meeting standards. So what happens over time is they start to lower the standards to the employees instead of raising up the employees to the standards. Yes. Like we start to let things slide and we start to accept mediocrity because we don't wanna have hard conversations. We don't have the patience to train people, which is one of my weaknesses. I suck at training people, like terrible, because I want them to learn it today. So I hire people that are better than me at training people. Like Kelly Murray, who's our COO, she kicks ass. That's her superpower. Um, but for all of us, how do we keep these standards high within our companies? Uh, this is David Ogilvy. Has anyone heard of David Ogilvy? All right, this is like my dude. Uh, Ogilvy was uh, one of the biggest names in marketing in the 40s and 50s. If you've heard the show Mad Men, uh, it's not directly based on his life, but it's based on a lot of what happened at Ogilvy and Mather, which is uh, his company. In the 1950s and 60s, he had a marketing agency. They were doing 55 million a year with 19 clients. Wow. In the, in the 1950s and 60s. Yeah, he, he lived in a castle eventually. He bought a castle. Yeah, pretty badass, right? Uh, another cool fact that has nothing to do with this presentation. When Ogilvy started his agency, he wrote down the list of five clients he wanted that included Rolls Royce and Shell Oil. Uh, by the time he, he was at the 55 million mark, he had all five of them as clients. It's pretty badass. This guy makes things happen. He's also known for having high standards. So before he went into marketing, he worked for one of the like fanciest, nicest restaurants in France. And the chef that he worked for was known for being the biggest pain in the ass, had the highest standards ever, treated all of his employees like shit, but everyone wanted to work for this chef because they thought he was the best just because of the standards that he held. So Ogilvy took a lot of what he learned from working for that chef and transferred it over to his marketing agency as well. And we're gonna go over just some questions that are gonna be good reminders for you guys so first thing is, what do I expect of myself? So when we're putting together this document, what are the expectations that I hold myself to? And be honest, like brutally honest. If there's areas of your life you're not holding yourself to certain standards or expectations. It's good to know that too. It's gonna be helpful for developing self-awareness. Second, what do I expect out of my team? Now here's where people get stuck on this because some of you may have people on your team that shouldn't be on your team and you're thinking about what you want your expectations to be, but then you're thinking about those people on your team, and you're like, man, I can't get them up to those expectations. It means you either have the wrong person on your team or they're in the wrong seat on the bus. So you have to reevaluate that, okay? And this happens constantly in, in my companies. Like we'll be meeting with, with the leadership team, and we'll start talking about our standards and where we're not hitting standards, and it immediately becomes a people, uh, a people discussion of like, is this the right person? Is this person, are we maximizing their superpower in this role, or do we just have them in the wrong role and need to put them in a role where they can maximize their superpower? Okay, but your expectations should not change because of who you have on your team. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, we, we hold that line. What are the principles that I run my company by? So this is more of the why behind your decision making within your company. Like, why do we make certain decisions to do this instead of that? Why are we more focused on relationships than revenue? Like, what are all these things that is gonna be really important for your team to understand so that they can be aligned with your purpose, your brand, and, and you as a leader? How do I communicate standards and expectations? What I typically see in companies is we communicate it at onboarding and never again. So how is this consistently met? For, uh, how many of you guys have core values for your company? If you don't talk to Beagle. Um, everyone hopefully has core values for their company. If we got your entire team in a room and said, I got $1,000 for the first person that can name all of the core values word for word, 
who's getting a thousand dollars. You know, you know how I know this because I did this with our team, and they're like, the the one they could remember was we over me because it's short, and then they're like something about making each other's jobs easier, and and then they're all looking at the ceiling. And I was like, I suck as a leader. <laughs> like, you remember those failures I was talking about? This is one of them. So. We met with them and I said, hey, what we're gonna do is every team meeting, we're gonna start by going over our core values right at the beginning. Cause I just want us to be more intentional about this. And then what we do is at every team meeting, we have, we go around the circle and everyone points out one person that did the best job of exemplifying those core values in the previous week of work. So we all shout out each other in that meeting, right? And then what we do is at the end of the month, we do a contest where pers everyone votes on who they thought for the month did the best job, and we just do a silent vote, and that person gets a $100 Amazon gift card. Now, everyone's looking for opportunities to show the behaviors that demonstrate your core values. Okay, and the other thing I recommend is besides just having a list of core values, have at least three bullet points of what behaviors demonstrate those core values. Because now you're doing a better job giving your team the roadmap of, this is how you show us that you have a we over me mentality. You do X, Y, Z. Does this make sense? Yeah. Okay. When are you communicating standards? Okay. Um, the more that we can ingrain culture, vision, and all of that into our daily communication, just the more in line your entire company is going to be. So any opportunity that we can tie something back to a core value that we can tie something back to the expectations that we onboard people with, we always look for those opportunities. And then us as leaders, how are we actually pointing out when people are showing those things and showing those core values? Because a lot of times, if we don't know our own core values, how are we pointing those out to our team and saying, hey, good job showing we over me mentality. Good job going above and beyond and making so-and-so's job easier. Like we need to look for those opportunities because I think a lot of times we all have high standards and we like to play gotcha with our team and point out when they're making mistakes and when they're not doing the right things. And then all of a sudden everyone on our team just feels like they're not good enough, they're not liked, they lose confidence in their work. Instead, we, we have to find and look for those opportunities to point out when they're doing a great job and, and when they're crushing it and be very, very sincere and authentic when we're bringing that to them. Uh, your team will like jump in front of a car for you if you start doing this. Don't test that though, like yeah. please. Vigil's insurance doesn't cover that. Um, and then am I willing to have hard conversations to hold the line? This is where I see the most CEOs fail is the accountability side of things. They start overthinking these hard conversations and they start to shy away from them and they just let the standards slip and slip and slip because they don't wanna sit down and have that conversation with this person. I still overthink hard conversations to this day, but they've gotten way easier because I, I feel like when you start having hard conversations, it, it builds conversational equity within you. Whereas the more you have them, the easier they get. And now, even if I overthink a conversation, I'll go sit down, have to write up someone, have the conversation, I leave and I was like, well, that was way the fuck easier than I thought it was gonna be. I was like, I don't know why I built that up in my mind. All the 50 different outcomes that I thought were gonna destroy the company from this one conversation, none of them happened. So let's make sure we're being willing to have those hard conversations. For me, one thing I do is I will just write bullets in my notes of like the three or four things that I absolutely have to hit in that conversation. I'll have my phone out in front of me during the conversation. So if I get flustered, if I get overwhelmed, I can just make sure I'm hitting all of those bullet points throughout that conversation. Um, I also recommend if it is a hard conversation, document it anyway, because that's going to come in handy if you ever have to let that person go, or if they're at, they're like expecting a raise. It's like, well, hold on. You remember these things we talked about? Let's go over this again, and then plan out the next 90 days. All right, number three, visionary evangelist. How many of you guys have a vision for your company? Cool. How many of your team members know your vision for the company? Well, like half a hand. Cool. All right. That's why we're going over this. All right. If we think about the average person, all right, just in how they think. All right. We're going to start with a homeless guy. I met this homeless guy, Mike, last night. He was awesome. We, we went on an adventure together. We got him some food, some hygiene stuff at CVS. It was cool. But Mike is only thinking about how to survive today. 
He's not thinking about later this month, five years from now. He's thinking, how do I survive today? The employee you have, we'll call him Steve. Steve over here, he is thinking about the weekend and the next paycheck. And that's as far in the future as he is thinking about. Okay, which means if I don't communicate my vision to my employees, they're never thinking that far ahead to begin with. Which also means they don't know where their job or their role is going. They don't know what future opportunities are available for them if I don't communicate it to them regularly. And then we have the CEOs where CEOs, we're thinking five years ahead, 10 years ahead. We're making decisions now and we're basing those decisions on how it's gonna affect the company five years from now. Okay, and a lot of us have our visions written down, but we just don't do a great job being the evangelist for our vision. Okay, if you go to church, the pastors at most churches, at least the ones I've been to, they will be so passionate and talk as much and as often as they can about their faith and your life in that faith. They are evangelists. They do it constantly with everything that they say. You as a CEO of your company, you have to be like an evangelist with your vision. Okay, you have to be bringing it up all the time. And not just as a group, but even when you do your individual one-on-ones with your team, we should be talking about what the future of their role is and where they're going to be able to move up to in the company if they're taking all the right steps. Okay, I, I know this from working for companies where I felt like I had a ceiling above my head and couldn't see a future and didn't know there was a future until after I quit. And then my old boss reached back out to me and was like, hey, I had plans for you. I was like, cool, you never shared them with me. <laughs> How was I supposed to know there was plans for me? Like I, I felt stuck. And a lot of people on your team might feel stuck if they're not in line with the vision. So one of the things that I would like to teach you guys how to do is create the most important document in your company. I feel like this is the most important document. Uh, again, I'm teaching you other people's ideas today. This comes from Cameron Harold. He has a book called Vivid Vision. Um, this document will change your business in a few different ways. So your vivid vision is pretty much, and I'll show you some examples in a second. It's a document that outlines the next three years of your company, and it's written like it's already three years into the future. So if you're writing it now, I'd be talking about February 1st, 2027. And I'd be writing the whole document like today is February 1st, 2027. Because when someone reads it, they're able to picture themselves three years into the future while they're reading the vision. And this document, guess what? You use it when you put job ads up. You include the Vivid Vision document because it does two things. It repels the people that don't fall in line with your culture right from the start. And the people that are in line with your culture, it attracts them. It's a good way to filter through all those shitty resumes on Indeed. It helps, okay? The second thing is you give this document to anyone you want to partner with, anyone you want to do business with, because they now see where your company is going and the vision for your company. For our, our martial arts school franchise, I shared this with a, a merchandising, a potential merchandising partner. And we only had uh, one location with a second one on the way at the time. And he gave us bulk pricing like we had 10 locations just from reading this document right out of the gate. So we got like insane pricing and no other company could compete with it just because we shared a document with someone. So my accountant has this document, my attorneys have this document, like we share it with everybody. So let's sort of walk through what this looks like. Okay, so this is for our Move Martial Arts, our, our martial arts franchise. So this is the one we did at the end of last year. Uh, so you'll see that this was dated for 2025. Um, but the very first page, the snapshot is just explaining what this document is. Saying we're reading this like it's already as of this date. And our hope is that by sharing this vision with you, you'll feel a sense of ownership and jump on board with transforming this vision into reality. So the second part is our core values. Now, here, here's the cool thing. Your core values in your vivid vision document might not be what they are right now. Because hopefully all of our companies are evolving over the next three years, yes? So like, if I had to think of the perfect version of my company three years from now, do we still embrace the same core values or have they evolved by that time? The next part is just who we are. And Bijal, I copied and pasted this right from the brand guideline you created for us, so it made it super easy. We just, uh, we changed some things like just to put it into the future more. Um, but it's three years from now, are we still the same? Do we still have the same identity as we do right now? Or is it shifting? Okay, Blockbuster didn't shift their identity. Netflix did. Okay, how are we evolving that? What is our secret sauce? Is it still gonna be the same 
three years from now as it is now, do our clientele still have the same values and goals that they're looking to, to have accomplished or the pain prob and uh, problem points they wanna have solved? And then the second page on there is, what is our sales and marketing gonna look like? Okay, so for us, since we're building new locations, we really wanted to feature how many locations we're gonna be having and how that build out's gonna look like over the next few years. Okay, and the cool thing is when we share this with our team, they see that there's more opportunities instantly. It's not just like, hey, this is where we're gonna stay for the next three years and we'll be cool with it, okay? We have what our average unit revenue is gonna be, average profit margins, average pre-opening for, for each location. So all of this is important because now we're, we're building this vision and getting everyone in line with where the company is going. Okay, what is our team gonna look like three years from now? Okay, do we have new roles that we're gonna need to have in place? Are we gonna have to build out the C-level team to be more, uh, more complex and, and, and bigger? What do the studio teams look like? And I think the most fun part of this is the achievement page. Because now you start thinking about what are we known for three years from now? What are the achievements? What are the awards that we're getting as a result of being who we are and kicking ass? This document is so crucial to brand alignment, to building lasting partnerships with people that are going to be in line with your vision. Like the, it's funny, when I sent this to our accountant, our conversation started to shift a lot after we went through this document. Because before then, I never explained to my accountant that we want 10, 10 locations in the next four years and that we want 1,000 in the next 10 years. Because now he starts to give me different advice based on what our vision is for the companies. Because otherwise, he's just looking at us as a single person LLC, and that's it. My accountant? Yep. So again, sh share it with everyone and anyone. Now, what I'm going to encourage you to do also is when you do this, you're going to print this out for each one of your team members and you're going to read through it with them and you give them all a highlighter. And you say, as I read this, I want you guys to go ahead and highlight the things that stand out to you and get you the most excited. And then you have them highlight all of it. And the other cool thing is as you read this, you're going to see two reactions from your team. You're going to see the people nodding in agreement. Those are the people in alignment. The people that are distracted or just like shaking their head no, those are probably the people that have to go because they're going to filter themselves out in the next year anyway as we start making this vision a reality. So pay attention to how they're reacting to your vivid vision. And then, that, then at the end, we have them share what they're excited about. And it breathes new life into your team when you do this. Like I, I had team members the first time we did this that reached out and was like, I wasn't really sure where I was going with this company until this. That's powerful, right? That, that shows the importance. Okay, let's talk about self-awareness. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a snapshot, which is sort of the overview of the document, core values, uh, the who we are page, which is pretty much your identity page of, of what the identity of the business is in the future, what your sales and marketing looks like, so for us, we kept this more individual location based because to be honest, our employees don't really care about what corporate headquarter does revenue wise. They, they can give two shits. They wanna know what's in it for them. So we're like, let's explain what's in it for you as far as opportunities with other locations. Uh, then you have your team, what your team's gonna look like in the next three years and also achievements. And pretty much when I created this document, guys, all I did, I, I sat in my backyard, I pulled out pieces of paper and I just brain dumped like all the possibilities. And then I did that for each category. And then I went just back and I filtered through it, got rid of some stuff, kept the stuff that I thought was in line with, with what we were looking to do. Uh, and then I gave it to my business partner, my COO first, got feedback from them. And then we met as a team to explain what the, what the future holds for the company. And I did this for all of our companies. So every one of our companies has a written vivid vision document that we use for it. Okay, self-awareness. John Maxwell, you can't have a leadership presentation without this guy. Uh, as a leader, the first person I need to lead is me. The first person that I should try to change is me. Okay, and this goes right with our quote we looked at earlier. So when we talk about self-awareness, we're gonna do an exercise real quick. So if you guys can pull out a piece of paper or a remarkable, whatever you're using. Okay, and all we're gonna start by doing is you're gonna draw on your piece of paper the two columns on the right. So we're gonna have a superpower column and we're gonna have a kryptonite column. 
I grew up as a comic nerd, so it's just appropriate for me. Okay, from here, take a deep breath and get ready to be brutally honest with yourself because some of this is gonna hurt, but that hurt is gonna help us heal later. Um, so the very first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start with the superpower category and I'm gonna give everyone a, about a minute and a half to do this. All I want you guys to do in this category is being honest, write down what do you kick ass at? What are you super confident in? What, what are your superpowers? And I just want you to take a minute and list as many of them as possible out in that superpower list. Now here's the thing though, the first time I did this, I started to lie to myself a little bit. And I started to put some things down that weren't actually superpowers, it was just like the positive self-talk I'd tell myself that I was great at it. So I want you to be honest with yourself, right? Is it really a superpower? Is there results to show that this is actually something you're good at? Or are you just maybe telling yourself a little fib? All right, so let's take a minute and let's play it all out and fill this out. All right, now we're gonna cry a little bit. You guys ready? <laughs> Just wanna bring the room up a little bit before we crush your souls. Um, okay, so a little story before we start this. The first time I did this, uh, I was going from a mastermind to an after party and there's this guy, Michael Burnoff, in the car with us. And I'm good friends with Michael now, but I didn't really know him at the time besides seeing him speak at this event. And I asked him, I'm like, hey, what is, how do you develop self-awareness? Because I want to be a leader. I want to be a CEO one day. And I was young. I think I was like 23 or 24. And I'm asking him this. And he goes, here's what I want you to do. You're going to go to your hotel room tonight. And you're pretty much going to do this. He goes, you're going to write a list of everything that you're great at. But he goes, and that part's going to be the easy part. He goes, and then you're going to get to the part of all your weaknesses. And he goes, if you start filling this out and it doesn't hurt to write it down, you're not being honest with yourself. So my ask for you guys is to play all out, to be brutally honest. And as we fill out the kryptonite side of our weaknesses and the things we're not good at, that we allow it to hurt a little bit because that hurts actually good because from pain comes motivation. Okay. And, and from pain comes motivation to fix those pains or turn those things into strength. So take the next minute or two and let's start filling out the kryptonite side of the list. I will not make you share this one. Couple things, this weakness column, we have options now. Okay, we can work turning some of these into strengths. So like when I first did this, the lie I was telling myself in the superhero column was that I was good with money. I wanted myself to be good with money and I would always tell myself I was good with money because my parents were terrible with it. But in reality, I still wasn't disciplined with money yet. So I had to move that over to the weakness column and I'm like, I have an option. I can build this skill and study how to compound money and invest and be more responsible with it. I could take something and I could delegate it to someone else. Money, I don't wanna to delegate to anyone else, but there's some things on your list that you have people on your team already that their superpower is your weakness. So delegate that shit to them, all right? You don't need to be doing it yourself if you have someone on your team that's really good at it. Uh, and then you also have the opportunity to hire someone that can be a complement to your weaknesses. Like my CEO, my CEO Kelly, her and I have so different skill sets. Like what I'm really good at, she isn't and she doesn't like doing. What she's really good at is why I hired her because all the shit I hate doing. It's, it's training people, it's, it's hiring and going through all the resumes and interview process, it's typing out systems. Like I will let her do that shit all day. Like, thank God. Um, but a lot of times what we do is when we hire, we hire people we wanna hang around or we hire people that we wanna be friends with instead of hiring people that are gonna complement what we suck at, okay? Because a lot of us, our weaknesses are probably gonna show up as deficiency, deficiencies in our business over time unless we find someone with a skill set to counteract that. Does that make sense? Yes, okay. All right. Congrats, you guys were honest with yourself. You have a true metric of what to go all in on. Um, and again, just look at and see how you can turn some of these weaknesses into strengths for your company as a result. Uh, again, I would highly recommend doing this with your teams as well. 
because it's a good self-awareness building for them. And it also helps to keep them honest. Uh, and you now know, maybe they have superpowers that you didn't know of as well when they go through the superpower list. Like we found uh, one of the people on our team at our agency, like she put her superpower was like content creation. And then she started showing us like her social media channels. And she has like videos getting the hundreds of thousands of views on her personal social. And meanwhile, we're having her do customer service for us. Like we weren't using her superpower because we didn't know about it until we did this drill. So you guys may find some, uh, some undiscovered gems on your team as a result of this. Okay, next, dynamic decision maker. Okay, as a leader, it is, us, it is up to us to make the biggest decisions of the company, yes? yes? It is not up to you to make all the decisions in your company and that's where a lot of us get it wrong. We think we have to make all the decisions. I don't know about you guys, decisions kill my brain power. Like my mind gets drained the more decisions I have to make. My wife's always like, can you buy a shirt that's not black? No, because I just want to grab a black shirt and put it on and not have to choose which one. Like it, it reduces the number of decisions I have to make on a daily basis. Um, one of the ways that I, I sort of modeled a decision-making process because I was trying to decide early on when I was an entrepreneur, how do I know if I'm making the right decision or not? How do I know if this is the right decision for the company or if you know, it's a big personal decision, how do we know it's the right decision? So there's three criteria that I run through my decision-making process through every single time. First one is, does it align with the values, both my personal values and the company's core values? I don't care how much potential money I can earn. If it's not in alignment with my values, I'm not going to feel good about doing it. Okay, that money is not going to fix how I feel, right? So... For you guys, when you're making decisions, is it in line with your values? And if it's not in line with your company values, guess what happens? Your team sees that. They start to abandon your values as, they, as soon as they see you abandoning the, the company values. Second question is, does it align with the vision of the company over the next three years? Is this getting us to where we need to go with our company or is it pulling us the opposite direction as a result? Okay, and lastly, does it does it like fit in the overall strategy of what we're doing? Okay, for me, all three of these has to be a yes for me to make a decision on it. If it's not all three a yes, it's a hell no. Every time I made a decision in one of my companies and it wasn't three yeses, something bad happened every time. Okay, either it didn't turn out like we thought it was gonna be or we started through the process, we put all this time and energy into it and then I killed it because it didn't feel right in my heart to keep going because maybe it wasn't aligned with the vision or it wasn't aligned with the values. So no matter what your decision make, making matrix is, you need to have some sort of filters that you're running those decisions through. So that way you can keep that alignment and you can keep your team on board with the vision of the company. Because anytime you make a decision that goes against the vision, your team sees that. Okay, and then they, they wonder if we're all rowing in different directions as a result. The other thing I wanna show you guys is uh, a rule that I learned a, a while back for uh, helping your team to become better problem solvers. So not all the decision making process has to be on you, not all the problem solving has to be on you. So this is called the one, three, one rule. So we have this as a rule in all of our companies. And this is something that we teach during the onboarding. Uh, and, if a, a comp and if a team member brings a problem to me, I just say one, three, one it for me and then they go through this process, okay? Or they go back to their desk and then they come back later with the one, three, one uh, formula for me. So the first one is the one problem that they're bringing. So when there's a problem or a challenge in your business, your team's able to bring one problem to you at a time as long as they have the following things. They need three possible solutions for that problem that they're bringing you instead of just the problem. So they're gonna come up to me and say, hey, we have this problem that I'm noticing Okay, our customers are getting confused with X, Y, Z. I have three ideas on how to solve it. Okay, and they're gonna give me all three ideas and then they're gonna highlight the idea that they think is the best solution out of those three. Teaching them how to become problem solvers, but at the same time, it is saving my brain power so I don't have to be finding solutions for every small problem that pops up in the business. Because how many of us as leaders feel like the only time we get our team reaching out to us is when something's wrong? I felt like that for a long time until our, our team started to learn how to problem solve correctly. And we started to empower them to problem solve. Um, now, Adam, what if my team member comes up to me and they give me three solutions and they all suck? 
it happens. It happens. You, you thank them for the effort. You say, hey, great job. Let me, let me brainstorm on this and think of it. And then I always go like, hey, your ideas got me thinking. What if we did this? Because it's still going to help them to take ownership over whatever the solution is because I'm including them in the process. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So this is a rule in our company. And if I even a Slack message, if I get a Slack message about a problem, I'm like, responds 131 it for me. My team wants to get a shirt that says 131 it for me because we say it so much in our company. All right. I feel like I should get a shirt just to be like, they come up this, like 131. Um, okay. Can we use this? Yes. Okay. Awesome. All right. Big idea generator. Finding thought leaders is hard. Yes. Okay. And a lot of times and, until we find other thought leaders to work alongside us, we are the only thought leader for our business. Uh, and that's tough because again, generating big ideas takes a lot of brain power, right? And it can be exhausting at times. I'm going to go back to David Ogilvie because he's like the father of this concept of the big idea. He says it takes a big idea to attract the attention of consumers and get them to buy your product. Unless your advertising contains a big idea, it will pass like a ship in the night. He came up with this criteria to help tell if you have a big idea or not. Okay, and his whole concept is even throughout his entire career, he said he probably only had about 20 big ideas ever. But all 20 of those big ideas fit the criteria that I'm going to show you guys. So this is hopefully going to be to help you guys when you're brainstorming of ways to stand out in a crowded marketplace. When you're brainstorming and how to pivot your company to get more attention and go the opposite direction of everyone else and find that nice blue ocean as opposed to the busy red ocean. Right. It's always interesting because you'll see people like on Facebook that come up with different ideas for things and they, they find a blue ocean in Facebook still, which is still a red ocean for most of us. Right. It's very busy and very crowded. OK, so I'm going to share this with you and then I'm going to give you a big idea that's working for us on Facebook right now with ads that I think will help kill it for you guys. Sound good. OK, so the criteria. So he says, big ideas come from the subconscious as a result of intimate knowledge of the product and how the product solves the problems of the consumer. If you don't know your client, if you don't know their problems and you don't know and have intimate knowledge of your product, it, it's really hard to come up with a big idea that's going to work. So you have to do research. Okay. As, as uh, someone that owns a marketing agency, we, we just took on two big clients, um, one of them is a brand new fitness uh, uh, franchise that's starting that Damon John is a partner in. And this is a cowboy themed gym. I know shit about cowboys. Like my dad used to watch some John Wayne movies. That's about all I know. I have to do an insane amount of research when I had to do the pitch to this company to actually show that I knew who was into cowboy stuff, who, who would be the perfect clientele for this so that we could do the marketing correctly for them. Okay, and if I don't do my research and I show up and I do a pitch, they're all going to look at me and be like, this guy does not know what we do. He does not know who our people are. Okay, and for you guys, even running your own company, like how intimately do you know your audience? When was the last time you surveyed your current clients to see who you need to go out and find that's similar to them? When was the last time you surveyed your clients to see what social media platform they spend most of their time on? Because maybe some of us are hitting up Facebook all day, every day, and all of our clients are on Instagram way more than Facebook. Or they're, maybe they're on TikTok way more than Facebook, whatever. Um, but let's go over the criteria for the big idea. Number one, this idea, did it make me gasp when I first saw it or when I first heard of it? Was that like a little light bulb, boom, popping up over my head the first time I read this? I know there's been other marketers that I follow that I see them do something and right away, I'm like, damn, that was a good idea. Like, I guessed from their great idea. Like, Alex Ramosi's book launch, like, crushed it. That, that was a big idea. Number two, is it unique? Is anyone else currently doing what this is? I always try and think and do research. Is anyone else currently going the same route or this direction with this idea or with this marketing concept? Does it fit the strategy to perfection? There's a, and, and we'll stick with marketing for right now. Does anyone know how you tell what a good marketing campaign is? How do you tell what a good marketing campaign is? People buy. That's the only metric. 
So you can be, you can have a very creative marketing campaign that might get a lot of attention, but if it doesn't get the results, the strategy is intent, uh, intending to get, it's not a big idea. It's just a creative idea. Does that make sense to everyone? So if your strategy is to sell more and your big idea doesn't follow that strategy, it's not a big idea. It's a creative idea. Okay, creativity is awesome, but if it doesn't get us to the end result, it's not really that helpful. Would you guys agree? Okay, uh, when I first started working with the F45 franchise, have you guys heard of F45? When we first started running ads for them, they gave us all these images to use of Mark Wahlberg and Mario Lopez doing F45 workouts. So when we first did the test run of ads for them, we put up these images that they gave us of these celebrities working on their gym, and no joke, in, in the first week for our local F45 location, we had 5,000 comments on this picture of Mario Lopez and Mark Wahlberg working out in F45. We had one lead. You know what all the comments were? If Mario Lopez is working out there, I'll go there. They're all like women hitting on Mark Wahlberg and Mario Lopez. So even though it might have been a creative strategy, it didn't get the end results for F45, so we bailed on it quick. Okay, the engagement was cool, but it didn't lead to what they were looking for, which is more paid trials for their gyms. So does it fit the strategy? Do I wish I had thought of it myself? Whenever I'm trying to like test a big idea, if I tell some smart marketers about it, and like, damn, I wish I thought of that, that's like one of the first signs that I'm, I'm going in the right direction. Okay, and even when you think of the big idea yourself, it should almost feel like you want to keep it a secret because it's such a good idea. And then the last qualification is, can it still be used 30 years from now? Is it something that's going to last a long period of time? I think with internet marketing, we, we sort of screw ourselves sometimes because we'll come up with these really good strategies and really good campaigns, but we don't think about the longevity of it. And we put all this work into building this campaign and then we launch it and it kicks ass for a month and then it's dead. And it's like, we just put eight months of work in to get one month of results and now we got to start over. So when we're thinking about, is this a big idea? Is this something that could be used forever? Really cool thing is uh, Ogilvy had Rolls Royce as a client in the 1950s. They kept using the same tagline for Rolls Royce for the next 20 years. Rolls Royce is still a client today of Ogilvy. They kept them forever, but it's because number one, everything lined up with their strategy. The tagline got results. It wasn't just creative, it got results. And now they have a lifelong client and a big client as a result of it. So. You guys ready for the Facebook big idea I was going to tell you guys about? Okay. I'm going to explain this, how we use it, and then you guys can sort of take it for whatever industry you're in and do something similar. Uh, how many of you guys have a face, Facebook business page? Cool. Okay. Here's what you do. You're going to create another Facebook business page, but it's not going to be for your business. All right. I'm going to, I'll use this as a martial arts example. So we have for our martial arts school, we have a martial arts business page. And then we have this other business page that has none of our branding, none of, none of our stuff on it. And all it's call, called is best kids activities in Arizona. And all we do is we post on there for things to do in Arizona. When we run ads, 50% of our ad spend comes from our, our business page for the martial arts school. The other half comes from the best kids activities page and is written like a mom recommending our martial arts school to the audience. The lead cost is 50% cheaper coming from the alternate whitelisted page. Another way I've seen this done is uh, in the agency world. So you have your our relentless media agency, Facebook business page. And then we have the secondary Facebook bu business page called best agency reviews. And all that page does is give content about what to look for with agencies. And it always ranks these different agencies and somehow we're always number one on that page. So when we run ads from that page, they're getting served an ad to use an agency coming from a page that's called best agency reviews and is written like it's coming from a third party. So now you guys are gonna be able to hit different pockets of your audience that maybe weren't interested at first because now you have third party credibility that's still first party credibility because you guys own and control that page. Does that make sense to everyone? So two separate pages. 
one of you're running ads through your business page like normal. The second page is a whitelisted page that has something to do with, with your industry, but it's not directly look, look anything like your business and you use both those pages to split the ad spend works amazingly. We've tested in a few different industries and every single time it's way lower or way lower cost per lead on the whitelisted page. All right. Number seven, relentless resilience. How many of you guys have shitty days, weeks, months, 2020? Um, man, how we stand in the face of resilience is so important to how we lead our teams. Your team doesn't need to know all the bad shit happening to you. Okay. And uh, I saw a, a post about a bison the other day it says uh, cows, when there's a storm, they run away from the storm. Hence the term coward. I just made that up. I don't think that's true. Um, <laughs> that was good though, right? That was, that was good. I, I had you guys. I had you guys. I know. Yeah. Don't, don't Google that. All right. But then you got bison. Bison go through the storm. They don't run away from it because they know that going through the storm gets them out of the storm faster. Does that make sense? So for us as CEOs, do we run away from the storm or do we go through the storm? Yeah, bison that shit up. Um, one, of, one of my favorite things I've ever heard is this one. Everyone wants to be a lion until some real lion shit happens. <laughs> like everyone talks the big game and then shit hits the fan and we just start running. Cows, yeah, cows. Yes, true. That's a good one too. But I think we can all identify this. Like we, when we go to one of these like meetings or seminars and we leave, we're all fired up. We're like, we're gonna go boom, boom, boom. And then life happens when we get back. Does our, does our momentum and drive stay the same? Or do we start to pull back as a result? So we're gonna do a little inventory to help determine which lion are you. And these are just, this is a good reflective stuff to just think, and you don't have to shout it out, but just think like, which side am I leaning more towards when this happens? Do I go into the storm or do I run away from it? Hard conversations. Which way are we, we leaning on that? For me, hard conversations isn't something to delegate. Like a lot of us want to delegate these things. No one can communicate it like you because it's your conversation that needs to be had in most cases. My, uh, my COO is awesome. She will help out at a moment's notice. When it comes to firing someone, she'll be like, can I fire them? And I'm like, no, like, let me, let me have the conversation. That's not that I get a joy out of firing people, except a select few. Um, but it's because I want to get good Thank you for the laugh. I appreciate that. I want to get good at these hard conversations. I want them to get easier. Okay. I don't want, I don't want to have to overthink these conversations anymore. So I know if I just do them more, I'm going to get better at it. It's like shooting free throws. Only way you get better is standing on the line and shooting over and over again, no matter how much you miss. Firing employees. Without raising your hand. Fuck it. Let's have you raise your hand. How many of us have an employee that we know we probably should have let go of already? Here's your sign. <laughs> Here's your sign. Hell yeah. Fire some more just for fun. No, I'm joking. <laughs> you got the firing leaderboard up in the office? <laughs> uh, stress management. Which way do we start to, to lean when it gets stressful? When we start to get overwhelmed? When we start to get frustrated? Okay, are we the person that takes it out on our team? Or are we the person that says, fuck this, we're gonna get shit done either way, and we push on? Sorry, my inner voice swears at me a lot, so I just, it's how I talk, apologize. I took ownership. All right, when we're, when we're taking ownership, again, which, which way do we lean? Okay, is it always the circumstances fault? Is it always our employees fault? 
here's the thing. If you're the person running your company, everything's your fault. I want to say everything's my fault. And that means I can fix it. When it's not my fault, I don't look. Oh, you guys know how to keep repeating. Sorry. That was good, though. I, I like you guys playing all out. Um, when we don't take ownership of, over something, we don't look for solutions to fix it because we're thinking it's not our problem. Okay, so when you start taking ownership for even the small things that happen in your business, it's giving yourself power to fix them. Okay, when we're pointing blame out or, or making excuses, we're essentially just giving our, away our power to problem solve. So that ownership is what helps you become a better problem solver. Upholding standards. Which way are we leaning on that one? Is it the wild, wild west? Or does everyone know the expectations and know what happens if they don't hit it? Um, for our, our martial art locations, our managers have 90 days to get goals back on track if they miss their goals. If they don't do it in 90 days, we let them go. Or they, we, move, we, we demote them to a lesser role. Every manager knows this, though. And every manager knows that, hey, if it's 60 days in and the, we're not hitting the goals, we better start kicking some ass to save our job. Okay, but here's the thing. The conversation at the end of that 90 days, if we have to let someone go, it's the easiest conversation ever. Because they know they shit the bed for 90 days. So when we sit down, they're usually like, hey, I know. I, I didn't do what I was supposed to. My bad. I'm sorry I let you down. Question? Just very specifically, but they don't get the 90 days. They don't get the standard that you most definitely end up having. Do you get the 90 days from this or is it 90 days from this? No. So that, that first month they missed was the first month of the 90 days. So, yeah, we, we'll, we do one-on-ones every month with our team. So at the one-on-ones, we're giving them feedback, and part of that feedback is on, on their goals. And then we also do whatever we can to offer additional training or help and support to help them get back on track for those goals. Correct. Yep. It does. Now, it, what I will say is if they miss the goal the first month and then they shit the bed even harder the second month, they're, they're probably going to let go before the end of those 90 days. But we want to give we want to give them sort of a runway to to get at least things trending back in the right direction. So if it's month two and they're still missing their goals, but we're getting closer, I'll usually give them that last thirty days to to prove themselves and get them back on track. Okay, and then clutch time. Are we the person that the game's on the line and we're demanding the ball? Or are we the person that's trying to pass the ball to as many other people as possible to take that final shot to win the game? There's a lot of clutch moments that are gonna happen whether it comes to deadlines or closing a sale or whatever it might be. How, how are we showing up in those moments? Like if you uh, read Tim Grover's Relentless, which I think is like one of the best books ever, he talks about a cooler, a cleaner, and a closer. And a cleaner is a person like the Michael Jordan, the Kobe Bryant, that the game's on the line. If you don't pass them the ball, they're gonna be pissed at you because they know they outworked you in practice. They know they took more shots than you in practice. And how dare you shoot the ball? Because you haven't been training as hard as I have. Damn. That's the mentality that we need to have as a CEO sometimes. Okay. Yeah. When that, when the game's on the line, don't you dare shoot that ball. Give me that ball. Like I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to win this for us. Relentless. Yep. I liked it so much. I named my companies after it. That's how good it is. And I had Tim Grover on our stage too. Yeah. Okay, last part. When we're tired, how are we still showing up? Yeah, I'm sorry. Here's uh, what we often suck at as entrepreneurs is self-care. Like, and this is the reason why when we're tired, we don't show up right is because we're not actually taking care of ourselves. Like for me, I know I can't be the best dad, the best husband, the best leader if I'm not going to the gym, if I'm not taking my supplements, if I'm not doing all the things that I'm supposed to, if, I, if I'm not able to just take time out of my day and think and brainstorm and journal, I know I'm probably not going to show up as the best version of myself for everyone else. Okay. And if, if our goal is to make our companies run as smooth as possible and we're not making the time for work on ourselves, you're never going to show up as the best possible version of yourself as a leader. So how many of you guys time block for yourself? Okay. When we time block, we're essentially saying these things are important. So I'm going to make time for them, right? 
what are you neglecting on time blocking that's important that you know should be part of it? Like for me, I was a workaholic for a long time and I know I neglected the shit out of my family. But when I, if you looked at my calendar during that time, it was just work every day, like 12 hours a day. So I, I remember looking at my calendar one time with a mentor and he's like, he goes, you, you want work life balance, right? I go, yeah. He goes, the only thing that looks important on your calendar is work. That's why you have no work life balance. So I started time block for family. My, we have date night every Saturday night, time blocked. We have a date weekend every month, time block, where we just go to Vegas or Orange County or somewhere close to where we live. We have dinner with the family, time blocked. My workouts are time blocked. Okay, everything that's gonna help me to show up as the best version of myself, it is on my calendar and it's a non-negotiable. If my assistant hits me up and is like, hey, can I book a call during this time? And it says dinner with the family, fuck no and be unapologetic about it because that's how you show up as the best version of yourself. Yes? Cool.